Um, Dr. Brown, um, how does one go about finding a neurosurgeon out of state? As you know, many people are willing to travel such an important type of surgery to find the best experts. So this is a sea change that's going on. Um, many of the universities allow telemedicine, but of course, as chairman of the medical advisory board, my first recommendation is start with the facial pain association, go to the medical advisory board list and pick out a neurosurgeon who may be close to you in the state. Hello, Ray Sakula. Hi, how are you all? The other option, maybe uh, Dr. Lim can talk a little bit about whether his institution allows telemedicine as a formal way of evaluating or at least screening patients. Thanks, Is that Dr. something Brown. you can do? Sure. Well, I, I think when people um, are seeking to get medical opinions from outside, um, the traditional path was that you flew or drove to where, whichever institution you went to. But with, um, I think with what COVID actually accelerated this and with telehealth, there are multiple avenues to do that. You can do televisits. Uh, some practitioners are licensed in those, in those states. And um, if not, they, um, many of these institutions have what they call medical second opinions. And they have these, um, they have these uh, vehicles that you can uh, use online and you can actually communicate and, and, and they can confer opinions for you. And so there's some nuances. There's a medical second opinion where it's sometimes there's a, there's a fee and there are sometimes um, these other, they, they call them different names, but uh, assessments where they can give you quick, um, quick ideas of what, whether or not you might be a candidate, for example. So. Um, if you look around most of these institutions, they have created these tiers so that you can be seen. I want to promote again what I mentioned uh, in my introductory talk a long time ago yesterday morning is what makes an expert. Facial pain is not a common thing. Many, many doctors are competent, but they're not experts. And so the, the way you choose an expert is important. Um, and if, for example, you want to see a, a neurosurgeon or neurologist in person, how do you choose one? You may actually get an opinion from one of the members of the medical advisory board who would be able to even refer you to someone nearby if that was something you needed to do and couldn't move. I'm sure, um, Dr. Sakula, do you want to have something you want to chime in on this? No, I would agree with the comments you all made. Uh, Dr. Brown, the world out there oh, and sorry. the world is open to you. You don't have to go to the guy next door if you're not comfortable with it. If you are, okay. But there are lots of elements on the treatment of trigeminal pain that are unique and require an expertise that it would be good to get started with the people that have it. Allison. Yes, thank you. So oh, Richard, um, Richard, you the next question off. is, if someone has a uh, underlying cause of their facial pain, such as an autoimmune disorder or a dental issue, how does that change what their options are for treatment? That's a medical question. Yeah. Go ahead. So, uh, you know, Allison, it's a difficult question. Uh -huh. and, and as Dr. Brown mentioned, um, the first place we have to start is the right diagnosis. So if it is in fact a pain syndrome that we would agree is a trigeminal neurology or neurology-like pain, we do go through the process of analyzing what is the cause of this. Now the question itself already poses or supposes knowing the answer, that it's an autoimmune etiology. And again, so now we're not talking about multiple sclerosis. We're not talking about vascular compression. We're talking about a very different type of injury um, or disease process. So that would be more along the lines of managing the primary problem, like an autoimmune problem, uh, that would likely fall to a neurologist who is someone who is very familiar with autoimmune etiology. And when I say autoimmune, I assume they didn't mention MS. It's a different type of autoimmune problem, um, some autoantibody problem. But again, 
getting the good a, a good neurologist or an immunology specialist or a neuroimmunologist is what they call our MS specialists now um, is really the right way to go because treating the primary cause just like MBD when we have a vascular compression that we clearly see is the right way to go at least in most of our opinions because we treat the actual problem and not just try and uh, put a Band-Aid on or stabilize or desensitize the nerve. We actually fix what's causing the problem. With an autoimmune ideology, we'd like to fix the primary problem. Um, if I could, just uh, two seconds, I would back up to Dr. Brown's uh, question about the interstate issue about finding a neurosurgeon. Um, two things. One is it does vary state by state. So um, the state that the physicians you might want to connect to have different laws. So California laws, New York, law, New York laws, and Arizona laws are all different. In Arizona, we still practice telemedicine, do full-blown consults with an interview, with Zoom interviews, and take a history and physical as best you can. And as you know, the, the, the history is very important for TN. Um, the other thing is that if you look at data of who patients use to drive their preference or choice of providers, um, a lot of it comes from friends. A lot of it comes from nurses. And I think if you look at the statistical answer of where patients say they get their information from in terms of who to go see. A, a lot of the times it's nurses who work in facilities to say this doctor is good. I'm not saying that's the best necessary answer to find someone who's competent or an expert as Dr. Brown was mentioning, uh, but on a factual basis, perhaps uh, that is where a lot of people get their recommendations from. Um, but I would follow what Dr. Brown talks about and Allison, what you talk about, go to an organization that supports the patients that has experience, that has patient feedback of what other surgeons' surgeries have been like if you're looking for a surgeon. Um, and I think that's, again, reinforcing what Dr. Brown said, starting with the FPA is a really good place, starting with other FPA patients and other FPA contacts. Uh, and of course, the MAB is always available. That's, that's part of our job. So I want to expand. We're all surgeons in this little Q&A. So what I'm asking is, please don't be afraid of us. We won't cap you and throw you into an operating room. We will help you. That's our reason for being here. I would, I would add to um, Dr. Brown and Zimmerman's comments that uh, making the proper diagnosis is critical. And sometimes we can do that. There are occasions when we, when we can't absolutely make a diagnosis and we can simply say the person has a type of trigeminal neuralgia that we don't understand, but as an example, two weeks ago, I saw a patient who clearly had an injury to the mental branch of their trigeminal nerve uh, from a dental procedure. And that can happen. It can even happen with a well-performed dental procedure, but that individual underwent a microvascular decompression. Now, fortunately, they weren't hurt by that operation, but that was the wrong operation for that person. And what they really needed was referred to a, one of, of, at least in my estimation, a very small number of oral maxillofacial sur facial surgeons who can determine if there's a neuroma there and take that neuroma out and put that nerve back together. And um, there aren't that many of those experts, but, but we know who they are and we can get you to those people. Great, okay. thank you. Just to um, add to that. Oh. Go ahead, sorry, Dr. Lin, go ahead. No, I mean, I think I agree with everything that was said and done. I think at the end of the day, um, there's two issues at hand. And I always say this, and I say in my talk, it's you're finding the cause of your pain and getting you pain relief. And sometimes those are two separate journeys that one must embark upon. And so, for example, people with MS, some of them in our experience have responded well to a rhizotomy, even though they have, quote, an, you know, an autoimmune disease. So sometimes, you know, you may have to have two... Uh, two separate conversations with two sets of doctors, but as Dr. Sakula said, we try to connect you with the right people that we would know. Um, I'd like to add, watch out for being labeled as something. You may be labeled as having multiple sclerosis, but that doesn't mean 100% that the multiple sclerosis is the cause of your stabbing electric shock facial pain. It might be, or you might have had multiple sclerosis with a single event 20 years earlier, and now 20 years ago, 20 years later, you're having this onset of spatial pain, which is stabbing and classically trigeminal. Is it because of the multiple sclerosis? It is necessarily so. 
So you need to be reevaluated by people who can think this through and not label yourself unnecessarily. Can we talk about pivot a little bit and talk about imaging? Um, we hear from a lot of people who are confused about what the right machine is, the right type of MRI, uh, um, using contrast versus not. Some people are imaged um, locally, and then by the time they get to their expert, are confused as to whether those initial scans are uh, accurate or appropriate. Michael, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think when you think about imaging, imaging is not really a diagnostic tool for trigeminal neuralgia. We try to use imaging, at least in, in our um, thoughts, to try to rule out other bad things in, in patients. So it's not uncommon when patients get an MRI, they get a, a standard MRI. That's it's not uncommon when patients get an MRI, they get a standard MRI. Um, that's sorry, I'm getting an echo. Um, so you know, uh, oftentimes patients come with uh, a, a MRI that may show maybe one slice of the trigeminal nerve, but the whole point of it is to look out for things like tumors or MS. And then once um, those things are ruled out, sometimes people then need a subsequent scan to refine the data. Um, someone's got background noise. Wolfgang, Dr. Leakey, you've got some background noise there. I thought I silenced uh, that. Is that better now, or? I think so. Yes. OK. Thank you. OK, sorry. You want to uh, reflect on if one is considering a microvascular decompression, what the best way to image is it? You talked about it in your presentation. I'm you sorry, who was that addressed to? I was asking you, uh, oh, you talked a little bit about imaging in your presentation. Perhaps you can expand on if you're thinking of a microvascular decompression, what the kind of imaging a neurosurgeon likes to see. Right. So even, you know, again, we talk about the right diagnosis is the right place to start. And Dr. Lim talked about the appropriate aspect of trigeminal neuralgia uh, is two things, if you will. One is a syndrome, the patient's manifestation of pain would be classic TN. But as Dr. Lim referenced, you can have classic TN and have MS. You can have classic TN and have a vascular compression. Um, so, as well as other things that might cause trigeminal neuralgia. So, the issue of imaging is also to establish a diagnosis, but also in some sense to guide the treatment. So, if you're looking as one of the options to treat trigeminal neuralgia, you will want to look for vascular compression as one of the etiologies uh, of the condition. And what we like to see is what's called the high resolution or thin cut MRI. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the 5,000 Tesla MRI. Um, 1.5 is probably the most common existing, 3T, 7T, they're all out there. But the thin cut portion is one component of important imaging. What we like to see now is what's called heavily T2 weighted images. That's where the spinal fluid of the CSF is very bright and the rest of the brain, nerves and vessels are shadows or, or outlined as silhouettes, but very easy to identify in, in, so to speak, high definition. It's very, very helpful. There is an issue of contrast and non-contrast. There is data showing that you can see, uh, get a little clarification of whether it's an artery or a vein or in vascular compression when there is contrast added to the, the Fiesta or the cyst or the other high T2 weighted image. Um, I don't think that's per se necessary. I think uh, there are some radiologists and neuroradiologists who like to work on the research aspect of this. Do they get more information from a pre and post contrast fiesta or pre and post contrast cis? At our institution, I know that we happen to get that, um, not all the time. And if a patient comes with a good quality MRI that doesn't have contrast, I don't find it that helpful. Um, but I know there is interest in looking at that. And uh, at centers, um, one of my neuroradiologists was stolen from Dr. Sekula's institution. Uh, Dr. Rath came from Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, Tonya, uh, she misses you and says hello, Dr. Sekula. Um, but uh, she is one of our leaders in terms of uh, expertise in imaging the trigeminal nerve. And uh, she began using that protocol, again, more out of interest per se than clinical utility for me. Um, but it is something that's doable, uh, but not a requirement. So again, just to summarize, thin cut, high resolution, 
heavily T2 weighted sequences, commonly called CIS, CISS or Fiesta. Uh, Jeff, you used another term, Vibe, yesterday. It was not a sequence I'd been heard of, I'd heard of before. Uh, some it's of those a John things, Hopkins um, thing. It's a, it, some of it's an institutional thing. Sometimes it's made by the manufacturer of the actual MRI machine that determines the name of the sequence. Some of it's your radiologist determine the protocol. But again, high, high resolution, heavily T2 weighted images, and specifically looking at the area that you want to see, like the trigeminal nerve area or glossopharyngeal nerve entry zone. If you have glossopharyngeal neuralgia, pain in the back of the throat. Uh, and hemifacial spasm. You know, to really watch, make sure it's clear that you're looking at the trigeminal nerve when the MRI is ordered and obtained. Um, I mentioned in my talk that um, there are two things. Well, first of all, let me talk about the, in, the uh, idea of contrast. If you go on the internet, you'll discover that there is some concern regard uh, infusion of contrast, this gadolinium. Um, it's much safer than the kind of contrast that used to be used 10 years ago, but there is some concern that this can be deposed, deposited in the brain and that that may have an effect. So you don't need the contrast necessarily for what we need. But what I like to be able to do is to have a study that shows me the nerve, the spinal fluid, and the vessel in three different planes so I can actually go on a computer and walk through the nerve and look at it in three different ways so I could really understand what's going on. Um, that isn't necessarily something, it almost isn't ever anything that I can do if I get the study done at a local institution because they don't put it together that way for me. So very often I'm having to repeat the MRI to my needs. Does that mean you shouldn't get the MRI before you see the neurosurgeon? Not necessarily, but again, I'd like to emphasize, why not talk to the neurosurgeon? We have the ability to do that, and then the right study can be arranged for. We'd like to welcome Dr. Uh, Wolfgang Lietke to the, to the discussion. Uh, just yeah, I can um, just, just throw in a very quick morsel of, of experience here where I, I am completely in agreement with Jeff uh, on the use of the non-contrast MRI that I will show the anatomy if we do this the thin slicing uh, through, the, through the cisternal trigeminal nerve root and we can click back and forth and make it look like a, a low-tech animated movie uh, what is the relationship of the blood vessel to, to the root and get a pretty good uh, view on that. Um, the one comment I always had, or the one uh, thought I always had with that was, well, MRIs are always done patients lying down, and there's some few MRIs now starting to do stand-up MRI. We spend most of our, our lives standing up, and that's when the blood vessel can bother the nerve. Uh, and so, therefore, that I was worried that the, the lay-down MRI might show us something that is not happening in most of how we spend our lives when there is danger or there's a risk that we get vascular impingement to the nerve root. That's that's one thought. The other one is the use of contrast gadolinium. Um, so gadolinium, to my experience, has been helpful if we are if we are going to hunt after some suspected scarring. So if the cisternal trigeminal nerve root and that vicinity there is a suspected scarring happening that is bothering the nerve or bothering the nerve more, then having the thin slices and the gadolinium will be helpful and is an advance over running it in non, non gadolinium uh, gadolinium so for example during pregnancy and lactation uh, to be avoided uh, and it can the, the calls can be made but if the question is scarring you would need to do the gadolinium scan uh, then for example after the pregnancy or the lactation i i would like to add i have experience using a stand-up mri and i haven't noticed myself any uh, advantage the problem with MRIs that are labeled as stand-up is they tend to be of much lower imaging quality and it uh, isn't adequate to do what we need to, to see what we need to see. Mm -hmm. Unless the technology changes, I'm, I'm not in favor of going to a stand-up MRI at the present time. Next. I think yes, um, since Dr. Linsky was set to talk about repeat MVD, I think it would be great to fulfill that uh, need uh, in this conference. So uh, all I'm going to say is, uh, can we talk about repeat MVD? 
all of us are, as surgeons, neurosurgeons can talk about it. I have one thing I want to throw in before I ever consider a repeat MVD. I don't like to explore. So usually there's a lot of Teflon there. It's hard to image. I insist on an adequate image the way I've talked about so that I can do the very best job possible before I would consider a repeat MVD to see if there's something in contact or compressing the nerve that may not have been noticed or may have been new. So I personally don't like to explore. If I can't see it, I don't want to do it. Other people comment. Richard. Hello, Ray. Uh, so, um, you know, I talked about this yesterday a bit and uh, it, to me, the majority of the determining factors would be what is the patient's description of their pain? If they really have exacerbations, sharp shooting, all the typical things we would say that still sounds like trigeminal neuralgia, uh, then I still think there's something we can do. Even if they've had previous procedures, regardless of the previous MVD or uh, other, other ablations, I still think that if they have their tick pain, there's still an opportunity to help them. When they have other components of pain, burning pain, crawling pain, drawing pain, pulling, things that I don't typically associate with a standard trigeminal neuralgic condition, uh, I'm much less excited about offering them something. When they have both, it needs to be very clear that I can help you with some of these pains and not all of these pains. And is that going to be good enough for you? Uh, but in terms of exploring you know, versus decompressing and taking out the Teflon or looking for a granuloma or looking for a vessel that was missed. And I showed some examples of that yesterday. Um, I, I do think you offer the patient uh, a benefit, especially if they've been down the road of already damaging their nerve with an ablation. They've tried a, a, a decompression, so to speak, but they still have a radiographic evidence of compression still existing. Um, and I do think going and taking oh, the time to take whatever's irritating the nerve off, if you can visualize that. Um, it's different if I see nothing on the nerve. They've had an MVD. There was a commentary by the surgeon that previous surgeon in the op note, nothing was found, nothing was done. And they did a partial rhizotomy, which is probably the most common scenario on a negative exploration. Uh, someone does uh, combing the nerve or sectioning part of the nerve. Um, if they still have pure tick pain, but they had nothing found and there's no Teflon there, then I'm also a little bit more reluctant to go in. It really depends on how how many other options the patient still has. Do they fully explore medication? Um, have they really gone down the path of ablation? Um, but if they if there's something there, I, I think it's worthwhile offering to them. If there's absolutely nothing on imaging and they've had a previous exploration, they've had a partial isotomy already, and they still have the bad pain, it's a little harder. I'm very slow to go unless they're really pushing to do something because they're in extreme pain. I would like to have them try something else. Although I'm not so excited about multiple ablations, but sometimes that's the only thing that's there. The important point you just made is an expert evaluation of what is the pain like? Is this something that could respond to a repeat microvascular decompression? And don't instinctively says, well, it worked, now it doesn't. Does it mean you should go back? First find out what the issue is. Others want to comment? Nope. I think at the end of the day, it's it works in the right setting in the right patient, as you mentioned, Dr. Brown. It's it's just you have, and but it is. Um, I think we would all say it's a little bit more uh, technically involved because they're scarring, and and so I think all of us are saying we have a higher threshold uh, to take somebody back um, to do these procedures. But the literature from, you know, the, the one that we often cite is Dr. Janetta's literature. There, you know, there are a group of patients that do respond. So, again, the workup is the critical part. And um, all, I'm sure all of us in this room have higher thresholds. Um, and so I think that that's um, the takeaway point. It does work, but it has to be in the right setting, i.e. the right symptoms, the uh, right radiographic um, Finding, then you probably want somebody who's done a good number of them because it is more technically involved because generally there's some scarring of the cerebellum to the dura and or the, the putrous bone and the anterior to it. So Two things to about that. Uh, Dr. Janetta's um, experience that, he's, that was published many years ago shows that the results 
of a repeat microvascular decompression are good, but they're maybe 10% less good overall than they were for the first operation. And um, I do like to say that a repeat microvascular decompression is a graduate level exercise. It's not something for every neurosurgeon, as Dr. Lim was pointing out. Dr. Sakula? Yeah, agreed. Uh, you know, you that's um, an operation that really should be done by someone with a lot of expertise um, because you can really hurt a patient uh, by removing whatever type of interpositional graft was placed by the former surgeon. Um, and uh, so you, you really need to have somebody with a lot of expertise to do that operation. I have a question for Dr. Litka. Can I ask him directly? In my Go talk, ahead. I said that one should consider surgery after failure of at least two well-tried anticonvulsant medications. I have a feeling that you might disagree with that based on your talk. Um, very, so to, to say two, and then you are be below two and you're above two, and that is really like a hard barrier. I would make it clinically a bit more case by case, and it depends uh, sort of an approach, which depends on a patient, how the general health and how how operable is a patient, or is it veering more toward try to really thoroughly implement the medical treatment, or we're trying to implement medical treatment and running into another complication, another complication, which is also uh, rooted in other comorbidities. And then it's like, okay, surgery is, is, is really an option. We should not withhold that from the patient. Or we can, we can dig and drill a little deeper. And that has, that, that is, I, I try to handle, or I have handled that on a, on a case by case basis. And that is with the surgeons whom I have, have worked. And we work together, we work together with, with um, everybody on the panel, uh, except for Dr. Zimmerman, where I had no direct referrals. It has worked well. Perhaps we should aim for uh, having sort of more concrete uh, guidelines and say, this is sort of a barrier and, and rather you should, um, once, once you go through this threshold, you should, you should, <clears throat> you should go toward the invasive treatment. Yeah. But I, I wouldn't contradict to, to, to that. Okay. I have a question out of the more topical out of the blue. Um, does anyone think that there is a timeline contraindication to operating on a patient who has recently recovered from COVID? This is out of the blue, but it's come up. Is there any information out there? Nope. I would just think well, the, I think that's, the COVID, COVID trigeminal pain has some really interesting basic signs or basic translational signs um, roots in that um, there are colleagues who have discovered that the trigeminal system can follow uh, what the olfactory and, and taste system do, namely they become insensitive and they, they become loss of function. And that there, there is a similar mechanism that goes through v, a VG, VEGF related type of signaling for trigeminal neurons. Uh, that's Dr. Kanna. He did uh, great, great work published in pain so it would be like smell and taste. And indeed, I have seen some, some of my patients have reported that to me. And I said, ha ha. But then uh, there's also clear evidence to the other side. Uh, for example, Dr. Price, who, who made these discoveries also using human sensory neurons, not TG, but DRG, human sensory neurons, and uh, documenting they become more sensitive as a result of COVID infection. And so if the COVID infection is, is over and the patient is, is not suffering from a long-term uh, complication and has like clotting issues or, or uh, ongoing respiratory issues and is so, so, so it's sliding into or could be a, a case of long COVID. If that's not the case, that could, that could still be a longer-term effect on the trigeminal system that makes patients more suffer or less suffer. And at this point, um, th those th that is um, a set set of data that that several groups around the world are are eagerly not only watching but crunching the data where that stands. So perhaps 
let's see what the, the outcome will be. And we know something about, you know, headache and trigeminal pain. Does that exacerbate when COVID recovers to a certain degree? Um, and if that comes in, then does that make the indication for an operation more compelling and say, go in, fix it? Or say, hmm, you know, it's gotten, it's, it's gotten worse. So if we wait a half year or a one year, there is also a chance it will get better. So that's, that's I think that's that's challenging. If it's, I, I'd say if it's a really acute, compelling indication and the recovery from COVID does not encompass these vital organ systems like clotting and heart and lung, uh, that is, is probably a green light uh, to go ahead. Thank you, Allison. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion here about um, what makes an expert and the importance of seeing an expert um, for treatment. But how is one to know what that means? I mean, yes, we talked about uh, FPA being a, a good resource, but how, do, how does a patient sort of compare apples to apples? Is there a chart? Uh, somewhere, you know, should we be asking how many do you perform? Should we be asking, what should we be asking to, to determine whether the doctor we're visiting is an expert? Um, if I can refer them to the quarterly magazine um, that um, the Facial Pain Association published just recently, I, I, I penned a, a, an essay on this. So, the study that was done um, oh, many years ago um, showed that, quote, better results, meaning fewer complications, shorter hospitalization, more discharges after a microvascular decompression occur if the neurosurgeon, and it is a neurosurgeon we're talking about, not in general, has done or does at least approximately 30 microvascular decompressions a year in a hospital that does approximately 30 microvascular decompressions. So it's not just the neurosurgeon, it's the team that's associated with the neurosurgeon, meaning not just the name of the institution, but the institution's ability to put together a team that takes care of yeah. you, the patient. So an expert technician needs to be a busy neurosurgeon, at least in terms of operative care of patients with facial pain. More than that, and there's no way to know this until you are interviewed and interviewed the actual surgeon, is what is his emotional ability? And that's based on how you relate. Is this someone who you can relate to, who you listen to and listens to you and gives you an adequate evaluation that you're comfortable with if you're comfortable that this doctor cares about you then he has the emotional capability on top of the technical ability and that plus a passion for the area as i've said and even as dr sakula is involved the ability to do research well all of us have done research on the medical advisory board so we are passionately interested in this problem all those elements in my judgment, make an expert. A lot of that you can evaluate before you see the person. A lot of it you need to see the person to see what you think. Sorry for the long speech. Richard. No, I think that was uh, making very good points, Dr. Brown. Um, one thing that's, I can't say this is data driven, but if the surgeon is committed to the facial pain population and has committed to that practice, I would only imagine that they have contact with the Facial Pain Association on some basis, regular, infrequent, but some contact. And they don't have to be the medical advisory board per se. There are plenty of good surgeons who are not on the MAB. Um, but if you are committed to the facial pain population, I can't imagine how your practice doesn't have contact with the FPA. And so if a name is familiar to FPA staff, um, I, I think that's good. If you see them involved in the FPA magazine, whether it be uh, advertising or writing articles for them, because um, I, I obviously you'll miss a few good surgeons that are out there doing good work on trigeminal neuralgia patients that don't necessarily have contact with the association. But if you're trying to find something that will lead you to someone that has committed their practice to trigeminal neuralgia and facial pain, 
I would think that they would be, just like any other specialty practitioner links to the professional society that helps patients. I, I don't know how you could be really committed to the patient population without having a link to the organization that supports those patients. I'll agree with that. <laughs> All right. Um, so lots of questions uh, about m medication. Um, you know, so many people have have really uh, 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 bad side effects, um, issues with sodium levels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what new medications are coming? What, what else can be done and how can uh, patients know sort of what questions to ask, how to get themselves on a new regimen? I'll just kind of leave that out there as well. Yeah, it's Dr. Lika's job right there. Okay, I was just typing in that, um, um, and I can just say, it, uh, in response to a number of questions there, uh, I, I think the catch word here is democratization of high-level and highly effective care for patients with, with, you know, critically severe pain, pain that is difficult to crack, pain in the context of comorbidity, and needing needing um, complex management, and that that would be available. In, in in every state or in geographically defined pattern, people don't have to travel far. Access is quick and and um, quick and uncomplicated. That is sort of can we get there? Is that is that what needs to be established? And how can this be made more uh, accessibility availability? But that's it is. I don't have a unique patented answer that will that will solve this issue like that. <clears throat> so a uh, practical problem with medication was first the sodium issue brought up, um, which is rooted in a so-called SIADA, uh, inappropriate secretion of the antidiuretic hormone by nerve cells in the hypothalamus. And they do that, they become sort of mad and they make this ADH hormone, lowers the sodium in response to treatment with carbamazepine trileptol. Other medicines that can act on the brain also do that like neuroleptics, tricyclics, but I have noticed that well, in my for my field, these carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, they're particularly bad actors with that. If that happens, um, I I try to help with zon zonisamide, zonagran, uh, lacosamide, vimpad, because also inhibit sodium channels. If the patient has a record that he, he she he says, oh that so that carbamazepine was helping, but then sodium goes down and we get into real trouble. So try with another sodium tropic medication. Can also, if it can be buffered, if it can be made up by increasing, for example, gabapentin, there's some low dose gabapentin in the background, like 300 milligram twice a day or so. And that has some effect as well. Well, bump it up and bring other things that also have helped bump them up and then see how can this gap uh, be, be covered. But again, that this can clinically be quite a dramatic picture where I have also resorted in in then um, infusing patients with lidocaine because lidocaine will block these sodium channels as well. And um, that then needs like, okay, the infusion center needs to play along and the infusion center is a bit recalcitrant because they need an EKG nurse, the EKG monitoring one-on-one -on -one patient and nurse. Uh, and that is not like, you can just get that within an hour. Uh, but I sometimes I got that in an hour because people needed that, and and it it was at times quite dramatic. But there, there's also many cases that are more easily manageable. Um, also, um, I think I noticed that the ever uh, less expensive generics um, sometimes when when the the drug is is uh, the the suspected bad actor is actually not the drug, but it's a formulation because the formulation is becoming ever cheaper and then just switching to uh, another formulation uh, or to the, to the real um, medicine as they still make, um, the, the prescribe as, fill as written, uh, solve the problem of sticking with the same drug. So that's, that's another practical consideration I like to throw in here. And then future of uh, sodium channel inhibiting therapies. Well, I already indicated my favorite is lacosamide, Vimpad, that's really strong uh, and has a better window of opportunities than carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine. Uh, that is a bit tricky to, uh, to get uh, coverage by um, insurance carriers. Um, 
and then there are uh, so the multiple players in the in the drug development therapeutics development arena are aiming for a modern modern day version of sodium channel inhibitors trying to have more specific of the sodium channels which is a family it's not one protein it's several and have more specific inhibitors of for example the most popular one is na so called nav 1.7 and have NAV 1.7 inhibitors. Uh, but um, I, my own read on that is very briefly, and to finish speaking a lot, is uh, I want to see that the, the NAV 1.7 inhibitor, whichever comes up, beats lacosamide Vimpad. That I want to see. If that happens, I'd, I'd very gladly yield and say, hey, we have something better. But until that happens, uh, I'd stick with my gun. Dr. Leedke, did I hear you say that you favor the name brand, not the generic? Or does no, it make I say that I have made sometimes a surprising observation that it was it was clinical suspicion came up. Oh, um, this is lamotrigine is making the patient have some some skin disease, which can be very alarming. And the skin manifestation didn't fit lamotrigine. And then I switched the Lamotrigin generic to the Lamotrigin um, name brand, and, and the entire thing went away. And also with carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, I had that, where they are now so, so cheap. And the generics are, and, and I suspected that, you know, gener making generics is a dirty business, almost literally. And that, that there is, there is uh, evidence uh, along these lines that this, you know, ever, ever cheaper generics are not really to the standard of, of what what one needs to do to do good clinical practice. Dr. Bicky, I have to just say, you know, it's interesting when, I mean, I think all of us on the surgical side, I mean, the things that we hear on the patients for side effects, right? It's either if there's efficacy, there's side effects, and there's convenience. Those are the three factors that people just focus on, right? Those are the three buckets, but the things that you know, we've always noticed in our clinics, or I'm sure all of us have, is, you know, patients say they're unsteady and uh, they feel like they're wobbly. Others feel like they're living in a fog and they just can't, they're, they're not sharp. Um, you know, th those are probably the two most common things that I hear from my patients that just make their lives miserable. We think it's not, I mean, we um, sometimes discount it, but those are very real and very uh, impactful for everyone. Absolutely. That I mean, as a surgeon, so I think you appropriately receive uh, the patients in whom those in, in whom that happens, psychotropic and CNS tropic effect that is clearly pharmacodynamic, pharmacodynamic effect of the medicine that is being used to try to keep the pain at bay. And they, they have that, then uh, what is the quality of life and how what, what do you have as an alternative as a surgeon? And that looks like they are, you know, they are taking the right path patients are taking the right path to see you for that. Um, Dr. Lim just left. Um, he's going to be speaking after we finish, so I don't want anybody to leave because uh, this will continue uh, when we finish the Q&A. We have Dr. Sakula later on also, so um, um, stay with us here. More questions. Uh, yeah, so what are the possibilities for things like stem cell treatments or immunotherapies, things that we hear of in terms of, you know, cancer treatments or anything like that maybe coming down the pike? Well, I mean, I, I would say that there, you know, Noema Pharma has a drug that's a, a glutamate antagonist, and that's, that's available now through different centers. We don't know how, how how that will be, but that's exciting. Um, there are no repeatable stem cell treatments that I'm aware of. Um, and in terms of immunotherapy drugs, true immunotherapy drugs, not yet. Um, I have a concern with stem cell treatment. It's a profit-making enterprise, at least in Florida that I've seen, that it's $10,000 and you'll be cured kind of thing, pay up front. I'm a little concerned about stem cells when they're offered. There's no research in facial pain that I know of that stem cells will be curative or even helpful. 
beware of spending your own money. So uh, in regards to spending your own money, um, a lot of the neuromodulation options, if I'm correct, are not covered by insurance for the purposes of facial pain, um, which is a, a big frustration when this is a really good treatment option for many people. So can you talk about um, what is covered maybe generally, what's not covered and um, how a patient can navigate that? Um. A lot of the onus, I, I've, sp I've spoken on this before, is you need help from the surgeon who's offering it. It will require, uh, the first request will usually be denied. The second request will usually be denied. Some insurance companies allow for outside appeals, which is, is somewhat helpful. And um, the surgeon offering the neuromodulation should get involved in writing the reason it's being offered. It should be offered for a really good reason. Everything else has failed. The patient is desperate for such and such reasons. And then it's possible. Um, I've even had patients appeal to their local congressman if it's appropriate and it's been successful. Now that sounds like an exaggeration. I said this in public once before and I was teased by Dr. Kim Birchall to say that, um, but it did work if it's appropriate. And um, you have to keep fighting. Um, the problem- Dr. Brown, maybe I can stop you for a minute. Um, I, I don't wanna leave off any names, but I don't really do stimulation for facial pain, but there, there's a, there are many patients that benefit and this maybe more than any other area is an area where you really need an expert and there's a handful of people that do a fair amount of it, including Dr. Birchall. I'm not sure Dr. Zimmerman does, but Dr. Politsis, um, Dr. Slavin, who spoke yesterday, Chris Winfrey. There's a, there's a number of people across the country that do it and do it well. And it's so nuanced to get it through the insurers that it's helpful to have somebody like that, I think. Would you agree with that? That's what I'm saying. You need do, the doctor do you involved. Do simulation, Dr. Zimmerman? I used to do a ton, mostly in the occipital nerve world, but it, yeah. it did involve facial stimulation for headache, general neurology, facial pain, but not much anymore. Um, one other nuance to, to add to what you said, Dr. Sekula, about getting an expert to help navigate through the insurance process and what Dr. Brown said, this is the business side of medicine. Some of it is very dependent upon the patient's insurance policy. And when, you know, again, Medicare patients are a little bit different, but when you have contracted commercial insurance, it really depends on your plan because they'll opt out whenever they can. And if it's not part of what's written in as an exclusion, this is not covered. And I've seen certain insurers clearly write this literally, this is not covered in your plan. Um, it's very hard to make an appeal and you can go through many avenues to try and get by it. But when it says, you know, facial nerve stimulation, uh, pseudopalatine stimulation, trigeminal nerve stimulation, trigeminal ganglion stimulation is not covered in your plan. It's not per se arguing right or wrong. It's this is the business consequence of where healthcare is with the insurance world. They limit their exposure. They said, look, you didn't pay a high enough premium to get that included. We just don't pay you the provider for that or the hospital. Um, it's not part of the coverage you opted into. So they have a different view of the world. It's not that they don't like the patient and don't want them to try and get help, but they'll say, well, you didn't buy that package that includes that and they may use that as their exclusionary criteria. So some of it is dependent upon the patient's insurance and, and where they've, so to speak, what they've signed up for and paid for. I, I didn't mean to imply that one should game the system. You have to be straightforward. You have yeah. to be honest. You have to give the real reason why you passionately believe that this person can be helped. No games. Yeah, I don't think it came off that way. No. One, was, one question I saw here from a patient was, can you tell us some oral surgeons to go to? You know, there's probably, you know, fair. what's well, a small number, but some people I know, Mike Miller in Chicago, I use, uh, it took us 10 years to recruit someone to Pittsburgh and he's quite good, a fellow named Larry Cunningham. I don't know if, if you all have other experts that repair peripheral nerve injuries that you use. Um, we have on our medical advisory board, Dr. Derek Steinbacker, who is both a yeah, pastor. Yeah. and an oral surgeon dentist. So 
he might be a resource. I don't know what exactly he needs to tell us what he can do, but he is a resource from the Medical Advisory Board to answer that question. And where is he now? Because he moved centers last year, I believe. He's at Yale University. He's not left. New okay. Haven, Connecticut. Got it. Sorry, I was thinking of Dr. Barbro. He switched. He's in Texas, though. We do have someone in because there are some questions about Texas. Dr. Nicholas Barbara? Barbara is on the, is 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 sort of reactivated. He's a Dr. Ernetta Acolyte. I like Dr. Sakula, and um, uh, he is in Austin, Texas, as a resource in that part of the world. Okay. Texas is another part of the world, anyhow. But I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> Um, I'm going to pose probably maybe the difficult question, you know, for people who have anesthesia dolorosa, um, uh, atypical, you know, TN, non-TN facial pain, what would you say to those people? What would you recommend for them? Where, where should they go? Who should they see? Want to start with the medicine and Dr. Liebke? I noticed that uh, anesthesia dolorosa is is some patients get a label stuck to their back, and that should not happen. Um, the clinics and centers that deal with facial pain, cranial nerve pain, um, they should the door should be as open to patient with this condition. Um, I think it just is a re reflection of the really challenging therapeutic therapeutic situation here. Um, it's a well, trigeminal nerve pain is a rare disease. Uh, then uh, anesthesia dolorosa within that rare disease yeah. box is another rarification. So um, the outlook to conduct studies with you know hundred patients per arm or so is just forget about it. It won't happen. So um, I, I have made some experience over 17 years treating patients with that condition. I can briefly share here, and I, with that, you know, question being logged, I do owe perhaps I, I, I owe a write-up of my experience to say that what what I did and what helped at least some um, was the combination treatment and and try to lob everything that that we can lob and that that has has shown some some impact and some effectiveness max it out and i have also i have made positive experience with anesthesia dolorosa with injections of botulinum toxin in the area where the patient has the most pain and, and um complaints and um i also have uh, seen some encor encouraging uh, results with the infusion of methylprednisolone so steroid intravenous uh, and combining that with with Botox and maxing out and then bringing in uh, you know a, a whole army of um, anti uh, nerve pain nerve neuromodulatory treatments. Um, I'd like to just add, I was... beware of being a labeled person. I don't necessarily think that you should become a labeled patient with anesthesia dolorosa. There are all kinds of nuances to having um, numbness and pain. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're a castaway with this diagnosis. There's a question underneath here. Who should people see with non-classical trigeminal neuralgia? Dr. Zimmerman. So I think, you know, it's a good question. It's it's almost related to the almost the, the deafferentation pain question. Who do you see when the answer is not obvious? <laughs> That's a bigger challenge probably than finding a good surgeon, uh, the expert or the, the competent surgeon. Um, it is tough. And I, I think, honestly, in the world of nerve pain, I think that uh, our neurology colleagues are probably, uh, and our pain practitioner colleagues, are the ones in the best position. How to find someone that is an expert in facial pain that basically takes very basic research. Um, you know, as a surgeon, we, we kind of recognize what we don't want to operate on, or hopefully we recognize that. 
Um, and from the surgeon's standpoint, the best we do is tell you what you don't need uh, in terms of identification of patients and patients with conditions that don't need surgery. Um, you know, resources like uh, Dr. Leitke uh, are very important um, because th those atypical or unusual or non-classical or varies from the norm or, you know, you don't fit the profile right. It's tough because, you know, no treatment's going to work really well unless you have a reasonably good diagnosis. Now, there is palliation. You might not have the reason of why you're having this pain, but I can try and give you these medications that work. Uh, like Botox, I'm not, I'm not, I can't say that I can give you a dissertation on how effective Botox is as a neuromuscular blocker that affects the pain impulses. Um, but certainly we know that it does help in some patients. But really, um, that's a challenge. And I would, I would ask Dr. Litke, how do you identify your colleagues across the country that are also people who work with the medical management of pain that shouldn't be operated on, that shouldn't have another gamma knife, that shouldn't have another MVD, and that shouldn't have any kind of additional ablative procedure. The one other caveat I would make is when this is the result of known injury, you've had previous surgery, specifically by a neurosurgeon, because we're the ones who get closest to the nerve intentionally. There are surgeons that get close to the nerve unintentionally, like dentists, oral surgeons, and, and after trauma, we go there deliberately. And if there's been nerve injury after we've been there, that's a, and, and it's a problem and the pain is now bad or worse, that's a real problem. And the, the biggest advice I can say is stay away from, so to speak, stay away from more of us, um, but don't have additional ablations. I think that's a very, very controversial area. But back okay. to Dr. Leafy about how do you find colleagues who, who have the interest that you do across the country? That's as hard as finding a neurosurgeon across the country that's an expert in, in, in surgery.